Hello and a very warm welcome. Uh, my name is Sri Krishna and I'm part of the Bangalore Literature Festival. On behalf of the festival and uh, the Bangalore International Center, a very warm welcome to World Lit. Uh, for those of you joining us for the first time, World Lit is the Bangalore Literature Festival's uh, digital literary platform uh, where we bring to you live stream sessions, uh, video interviews and podcasts uh, with leading international and Indian authors. Uh, we're delighted as always to be partnering with the Bangalore International Center for this. Uh, we launched World Lit a few months ago and we've had some very interesting conversations on the platform uh, with the likes of uh, Pico Ayer, uh, Anthony Horowitz, uh, Tracy Chevalier, Jonathan Drury and others. Uh, we're quite excited about how the platform is evolving and uh, we hope to feature more authors in the days to come. Today, uh, we're delighted to bring to you two outstanding authors, uh, best-selling British novelist known for her psychological thrillers and someone who uh, describes herself as a lifelong Agatha Christie addict, uh, the lovely Sophie Hanna. Uh, and in conversation with her, banker, author, uh, inimitable storyteller, and someone who describes, and uh, of course, uh, someone who'd like to be described, and I'm sure is already at this point in time, uh, known as the John Grisham of uh, financial thrillers, uh, Ravi Subramanyam. Uh, Sophie, welcome to World Lit, and uh, Ravi, thank you for readily agreeing uh, to be part of this. Uh, your sessions at the Bangladesh Festival, I think, not too long ago. Ravi, you were with us last year. I think so. Yeah. Was with us in 2018. Uh, still very, very well remembered by our audiences. And uh, we're glad uh, both of you are with us again here. And uh, over to you, Ravi. Thanks, Sri Krishna. And uh, a big hi to Sophie. Uh, Sophie, welcome on the show. It's a pleasure Thank to meet you. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I'll drive, I'll dive straight into the conversation, Sophie. Uh, Okay. You know, I was reading some reviews on your latest novel, The Killing of King Shahil. And um, if I look at it, Washington Post calls it the classic Christie. And uh, Publishers Weekly says that fans of classic fair play puzzle mysteries will clamor for more. And USA Today says that Sophie Hanna does an egoless, silky job of reviving Agatha Christie's beloved Belgian detective novel, Detective Hercule Poirot. Enough so to hope that Hannah turns to Miss Marple next. <laughs> now, mysteries are typically the most difficult to describe. If somebody were to ask you, you know, what is it about? And so it's always best left to the author to describe what the book is all about. So before we yeah. go ahead with the session and the other questions, Sophie, um, and because the session is about the murder, the killings at Kingfisher Hill, um, why don't you tell us all about the book or, or whatever you can tell us about that book? Okay, well, I actually find it quite easy to describe mystery novels because what I do is I describe the the sort of mysterious plot hook mm -hmm. and I and then I stop there, which is ideal for describing a mystery novel because it makes people want to read it if you don't tell them the whole story, but just give them a little teaser. So The Killings at Kingfisher Hill is my fourth Hercule Poirot novel and it starts when... Um, Poirot and his sidekick, who is Inspector Edward Catchpool of Scotland Yard, they are both on their way to the very posh and exclusive Kingfisher Hill Estate, mm -hmm. which is a gated country park estate in the English countryside. They're on their way there because a man who lives there, Richard Devonport, has summoned them because his fiance is about to be hanged for a murder that Richard is certain she didn't commit. And it was the murder of Richard's brother, Frank Devonport. Mm -hmm. So Helen, Richard's fiance, is imminently going to be hanged for this murder. And Richard is convinced that she's innocent. So he asks Poirot to come and sort it out. So Poirot and Catchpool, at the beginning of the story, are just getting on a coach. It's a sort of luxury passenger coach. And they are on their way to Kingfisher Hill to try and solve the mystery of who killed Frank Devonport. And when they board the coach, they notice there's a very distressed and frightened woman mm -hmm. who is also, at first it looks as though she's not going to get on the coach, as though she might be a bit scared of getting on the coach, but then she does. And then about 10 minutes into the journey, she leaps up out of her chair and says, I cannot sit in that seat any longer. If I stay in that seat for the rest of this journey, I will be murdered. Mm -hmm. And Poirot obviously talks to her about this and tries to help her. And she tells him a very weird story about how a stranger has warned her weeks ago 
that if she sat in that particular seat, she would be murdered. And yet that is the seat she's sitting in. So Poirot's first question is, well, why did you sit in that seat? So it's all very mysterious. Nobody does get murdered on the coach, but somebody confesses to a murder. So while Poirot and Catchpole are on their way to Kingfisher Hill, two other things happen in, inside the coach that are related to two other murders. So Catchpole starts to think this is very strange. How can it be that on our way to investigate this murder, we hear this talk of two other murders. This is very strange. And then when they get to Kingfisher Hill, there is another murder. There's a dead body in the house and nobody knows who the dead body is. It's very mysterious. It's just this body and the face has been disfigured so, you, so it can't be identified. But there's a note that's found on the body that makes Poirot absolutely certain that there is a link between the strange incidents on the coach and this new body. So then he has two mysteries to solve. Who murdered Frank Devonport, but also who is this dead body that's turned up in the house and how is this new dead body connected to the strange events on the coach journey? Oh, that's interesting. No wonder it's... Uh, many, many mysteries. I, I like to really pile on the mysteries and the mysteriousness because as a reader of crime fiction, that is what I love most. So... So no wonder it's stopping the charts already, uh, Hannah. And, and I think uh, uh, in India, uh, it's it's got released on September twentieth, and okay. and I'm sure and I'm sure that it'll 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 be topping the charts pretty soon. So really? best wishes for that. Like like always, like all your books have always topped the charts here. I'm sure this one too will. Well, uh, but my next question to you, uh, Sophie, is. Uh, how did you how did you land this in the sense that this is probably something which is uh, uh, which any mystery writer would 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 die for i would kill for how did you land this uh, coveted task of carrying the entire agatha christie legacy, legacy forward and uh, writing novels about one of the most loved detectives well, first of all, I'm not sure it's true that any crime writer would have loved to do it because... Oh, I would. <laughs> <laughs> well, some definitely would. But what, what's been really interesting for me is that loads of people have said to me, you're braver than I am. If I'd been asked to do that, I would have said no, because it would have just scared me so much to think sure. I had to fill the shoes of Agatha Christie. Now, I adopted the opposite approach. I thought, well, nobody can ever fill the shoes of Agatha Christie. Agatha Christie is probably always going to be the biggest crime writing genius that the world has ever known. She's such a legend. She sold billions of copies. And so I just started out with the assumption that I was not going to be filling her shoes in the sense of being as great a genius as she was. That didn't feel like an option. So what I thought was, I'm going to see my role here as being kind of almost like a sidekick a bit like Catchpool is to Poirot or like Hastings is to Poirot. I'm the sidekick who isn't the great genius, but I'm still going to do my absolute best mm. to be a vehicle so that the great genius can still have an effect. So, you know, one of the reasons I accepted the, the task when, I, when it was offered to me was that I thought, you know, this is a way to show the world that Agatha's character Poirot is still absolutely relevant today and he's such a great fictional character and i hope that it would persuade more and more people to read or reread agatha's book so so that was great because i felt like i was sort of working for something greater than myself and in terms of the sort of feeling daunted by it i always think and this is something i teach in my dream author coaching program for writers Whenever there's an event that might make us feel daunted or scared because it feels like just too much for us, we always have the opportunity to think, is there a different way of approaching this? Instead of thinking, this is scary, this is risky, I'm daunted and so I'm not going to do it. We can always think, this is exciting. This is a challenge that is going to stretch me beyond the level of my current capabilities and therefore, yes, it's obviously going to be uncomfortable and scary, but I'm going to end up being a better writer and a braver person 
if I accept this challenge. So from the start, when it was suggested to me, my attitude was, yes, it is scary, but I'm going to choose to think of that as excitement rather than fear. And I'm just going to do it. And I also thought, you know, what's the worst that could happen? If I do it and it's terrible and I make a complete mess of it, then the only person whose reputation is going to be affected is me. And I was willing to take that risk. If I'd have thought that I could somehow damage Agatha Christie's reputation or her brand, then I wouldn't have done it because I wouldn't have wanted to take a risk on her behalf. But I thought, well, even if I write the worst book ever, everyone's just going to go, this Sophie Hannah person's terrible, but Agatha Christie is still brilliant. And that's fine. I was willing to take that risk. And I'm so glad I did because... I've just loved every second of it. Writing all four books has just been an absolute joy. In terms of how it came about, I did not seek it out. I would never in a million years have had the idea that I should write Poirot novels. It would not have occurred to me any more than it occurs to me that I should be the Queen of England or, you know, marry Clint Eastwood. I mean, these things just do not crop up in my brain. So it would never have occurred to me to suggest it what happened was that my literary agent was in a meeting with Harper Collins and he knew that they were Agatha's publishers and he just thought of it off the top of his head. And so he interrupted this meeting, which was about something completely different. The meeting was not about me and it was not about Agatha. And he just interrupted the meeting and said, Hey, you guys publish Agatha Christie. I have this author who's a massive Agatha Christie fan why don't you uh, ask her to write a new prior novel? And the editor said to him, no way. The family, the Christie family would never want something like that to happen. We've suggested to them in the past that they could do new books and they were absolutely against the idea. And so my agent rang me up and said, oh, well, I suggested this thing. And they said, no, I was like, great. I wish you'd thought to ask me before suggesting it. Um, and then the next day, the very next day, my agent rang again and said, the Christie family want to meet you. And I was like, what? That sounds very unlikely, given what we said yesterday. And it turned out that the next day after my agent had made the suggestion, that same HarperCollins editor had had a meeting with the Christie family, just by coincidence. And the Christie family at that meeting had said, this is going to surprise you after everything we've said all these years, but we, the family, are now thinking we might actually want there to be a new book. At which point the editor said, well, that's a coincidence because I had this agent in my office yesterday who thinks he might have the perfect author. Oh, lovely. Yeah. So then we had that meeting and we got on brilliantly and it all just proceeded from there. And that's how the entire series is now. Uh, how many more books planned in this entire Agatha Christie series? Um, I don't know at the moment because um, I'm sort of the junior partner in this enterprise and Agatha Christie is the senior partner. So what I do is I deliver each book and I do my book events and my promotion, promotional activity and I wait for the family to ask me if they want another one. And they may not, you know, they might decide after a certain point, that was nice, but we don't want to continue this indefinitely. And I never know, you know, I'm happy either way. I decided when I did, did the first one that for as long as the family want me to write new Poirot novels and for as long as I've got ideas that I'm really keen on, uh, then I'm happy to carry on. I, I don't, I would never desert Poirot and I would try not to let him down. But equally, if at a certain point the family decide that they have had enough Poirot novels and they don't want any more, then obviously they they are the ones who have to make that choice. And I'm really happy to just go along with whatever they decide so I think there'll be at least my guess would be that there will be at least one or two more but mm -hmm. no no firm plans at this point any, any anything um, beyond Hercule Poirot you mean other Agatha Christie characters right. no so I have been asked many times do I want to write Miss Marple would I ever write Miss Marple on one level, I would absolutely love to write a Miss Marple novel, but I also sort of feel that I shouldn't mm. because I feel that Agatha Christie is such a, such a sort of legend and so much the queen of crime that for one contemporary writer like me to write more than one of her characters, that would almost feel 
as though I was trying to be Agatha Christie, which I never can. So I'm very happy to stick to Poirot novels. And I think if the Christie family would like new Miss Marple novels, which, you know, I would love to read new Miss Marple novels, I think it would be quite exciting for them to for maybe choose another writer to do that at some point in the future. But um, I don't feel as if it should be me. And I also think that somehow... I've kind of got enough to do and I want to do everything that I do really well. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want to take on too much. Okay. So, uh, you know, I'm a bit struggling with the, with the sequencing of the questions because I have too much to ask you and, and you know, I'm just, <laughs> so pardon me if the secret with the questions seem to be a bit, uh, out of sequence. Uh, so, uh, you know, from what you say and what I've read of you and what, and, and the fact that the family picked you up, for writing, um, for carrying the legacy forward. Uh, you seem to be uh, one of the biggest fans of Agatha Christie ever born. So, uh, <laughs> definitely one so there of them. Are millions of them across the globe, but I'm sure you're one of the, you know. I'm, I'm definitely one of them, yes. There's plenty of others, but I am one of them, yes. So, uh, how and when did you first get introduced to Agatha Christie? And, and uh, where did the relationship start? And, 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 and how did you progress? Well, the relationship started when I was 12. I had finished reading all of Enid Blyton's mystery stories. And I was an absolute confirmed mystery addict. I basically, from the age of about seven, when I first discovered Enid Blyton, I knew that mysteries were my favorite kinds of stories. And I've never changed my mind about that at any point since. So when I was about 12, I was too old for Enid Blyton. And I'd read all of her books. And my parents who were very um very keen on supporting my reading habit they knew that i needed to move on to some kind of more grown-up mysteries and my dad used to go to second-hand book fairs very often and he found a copy of an old miss marple novel uh the body in the library he found that book at a second-hand book fair and he bought it for me thinking oh she might like this this is a mystery um, and he brought that book back for me and I absolutely adored it. And that was where my lifelong love of Agatha started. From that point onwards, I read everything she'd ever written. I then reread it every few years, all her entire oeuvre. And yeah, I was a lifelong fan from that point on. But The Body in the Library was my first. And it's actually one that I recommend when people say to me, which they often do, you know, my son or my grandson has never read Agatha Christie. Where would you recommend, you know, a, a newcomer should start? I think The Body in the Library is an excellent one to start with because it has all the sort of conventional Christie delights, but it's also a particularly well-crafted and flawless book. I mean, I've read it several times now and you, you just can't find anything wrong with it, which isn't true of all Agatha Christie novels. So it's a very good one to start with. Is that your favourite too? It's probably not my absolute favourite, but it's it's certainly in my top 10 Agatha Christie novels. Yeah, I think my absolute favourite at the moment is probably The Hollow. Mm -hmm. But I, I have different favourites depending on where I'm at in my rereading schedule. So did you, I, I believe you had to reread the entire Agatha Christie series just to make sure that you're consistent with your characterization of, of Hercule Poirot. How did you, how did you manage to? Uh, I mean, I didn't have to be read. I didn't have to. I, I could have, I mean, I knew Poirot very well already from having read all the books four or five times. But when I found out that I was going to be writing a new Poirot novel, I, I decided I wanted to reread all of Agatha's Poirot novels just to kind of be really freshly immersed in you know Poirot, Poirot and his world. So how did you manage to uh, keep your uh, keep Sophie Hannah in that particular book? I know it was Agatha Christie's novel but but how did you leave your stamp on that novel in terms of the story and characterization? And well I, I didn't even think of one. one. I, 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 did, I did notice that when I read your books because the narrative Sorry, was pretty... You noticed what? That catch pool is is a big difference between the two novels, between the yeah, yeah. novels and hence the narration clearly changes. So uh, yeah, catch pool is um, catch pool is my creation, and he's Poirot's sidekick for all of my Poirot novels. Um, 
that wasn't really to put my stamp on anything. That was more because I knew that if I tried to do Hastings, I would get the voice wrong because Hastings' narrative voice is Agatha Christie's prose style. And I don't believe that one writer can or should try to mimic the style of another. So I thought, well, if I create a new character in the form of Catchpool, then that will be a new person writing about and talking about and working with Agatha Christie's Poirot, who we all know and love. And I thought that was a brilliant way of reflecting the actual situation because I'm a new person writing about and working with Poirot. So he's, you know, I haven't changed Poirot in any way. He's still Agatha Christie's Poirot in every detail, but I'm a new voice writing about him and Catchpool is a new voice writing about him. So that just seemed a really sensible way to approach it. I never really thought, how do I put my own stamp on this? Because I just, I guess I just take for granted that when, when anyone writes a book, they can't avoid putting their own stamp on it. You know, the, kind, the kinds of stories that I make up, I mean, obviously I'm consciously trying to include as many of the sort of traditional Christie delights as I can, like, an incredibly intriguing mystery, lots of clues, some red herrings, a denouement where the truth is revealed, you know, all those things. But I'm also, that there's a way in which all of the stories are very Sophie Hannerish. And that's one thing that readers often say, like that they, they love the fact that they can see all the Agatha-ish things, mm -hmm. but they can also see all the me-ish things as well. So do you, uh, you've, um managed to um, present Hercule Poirot in pretty much the same style. But have, have, have you ever got a feedback from your readers saying that, look, Agatha Christie depicted Hercule Poirot like this. You are depicting Poirot in a different manner. Uh, this is not what Agatha Christie would have done. Uh, or this is not... I mean, occasionally, occasionally someone will write an email saying something like that. Um, and I will always write back and sort of explain that the way I read it, when I read Agatha's Poirot novels, he's not 100% consistent from one book to another. So he, in some books, in some of the Agatha Poirot novels, he does things which in other of the Agatha Poirot novels, he says he'd never do. Mm -hmm. So there is, and I don't think that's a problem. I think real people are inconsistent. Real people do say, I'll never do that. And then they do it, you know, so... Um, to me, Agatha's creation of him actually makes him seem like more of a real person. You know, where in the, the murder of Roger Ackroyd, when he goes and lives in that village so that he can grow marrows. Now, you could look at that and go, Poirot wanting to grow marrows? No, he would want to stay in London and have his marrows delivered from Harrods or something. But actually, I don't think that's inconsistent characterization. I think that's a brilliant way of reflecting the fact that real people sometimes do get it into their heads that they're a totally different kind of person from the kind they actually are. And so they go and do something that's very out of character and then they discover that it doesn't suit them. So Poirot in Roger Ackroyd discovers that being a marrow grower doesn't really suit him that well. And so by the end of the book, he is no longer intent on growing marrows in the countryside. Um, so yeah, sometimes I do get emails like that and, and that's fine. I, I always love to hear any feedback that readers have um, but I think it's quite interesting when readers want fictional characters to be 100% consistent because real people never are. Yeah, interesting. Uh, one more aspect of the book that I would like to touch upon is the humour. You know, uh, uh, humour is possibly the most difficult form of writing and uh, not many people are able to do it properly and, and uh, in a manner in which the reader actually likes it. Uh, but when I was reading um, this particular book of yours, uh, I could find that the humor, the subtle humor in conversations between Catchpool and uh, Poirot uh, couldn't be missed. And I found myself at times just, just smiling at the conversation and the digs that they take at each other. And how did you manage that? You know, it, it's, uh, I find that something new in this book compared to the, the previous three. It was there in bits and pieces earlier, but in this book, it's it's taken a form of its own. And uh, is that because Catchpool has evolved? Is that because you consciously do it? How do you tackle humor? So 
in terms of from the point of view of me as a writer humor of that kind banter and wit and like that sort of back and forth that actually comes really naturally to me mm -hmm. I find it much harder to write with no humor I do sometimes do it but I find that harder um yeah I think Catchpool is evolving in every book so in this book he's well not actually while the event's taking place but he's writing the account of this case he and Pro solved together and this is the fourth book he's written about his adventures with Poirot. Mm -hmm. And I think he's starting to actually settle into it and enjoy the fact that he is spinning a yarn. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he wants to tell accurately what happened to him and Poirot and how they solved this mystery. But he also is enjoying the fact that he's writing a book. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think, I think I'd explain it by saying that Catchpool wants to entertain the reader so yes there's obviously the tension and the mystery and is Helen the fiance going to be hanged and what's the truth about the murder there's all of that and the main mood of the book is tense mystery solving but Catchpool also when he's looking back at the events he's kind of chuckling to himself about some of them particularly his conversations with Poirot and so he wants to he wants that humor to come across and it's also, you know, in Agatha's books, there's a strong vein of humour in many of them. Like, there, there may be the darkness and the danger and the murder, but there's also lots of wit and banter and sort of social observation of a humorous kind. I think that actually is a, a feature of Agatha's work that makes it so enjoyable. How do these stories come to you, uh, Sophie? In sense, do you, uh, and how do you write? in the sense that uh, uh, how do you plot your stories and, 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 and how do you write in the sense that do you write your book from page one onwards and then plot as you go along or do you have the entire story in front of you before you start writing? Because I know that there are a few writers in this world who actually are, are writers who just write from page to page and uh, Jeffrey Archer for instance is one of them who doesn't plot his stories beforehand uh, and uh, how, how do you write? Do you, do you have the entire plot out in front of you before you? Yeah, so I'm a planner. I always have a thorough, very, very thorough start to finish plan before I start writing. But I only sit down and start writing the plan once I've got enough ideas that I start to feel I can't carry the elements of this story solely in my head anymore. Usually the first idea that will occur to me is the opening mystery, like what's going on and what, you know, it's usually a, a puzzling scenario or an intriguing scenario where I'm puzzled and I would like to know the solution. Like, why would that ever happen? So I usually start there. Occasionally I'll start with an ending. In Closed Casket, my second prior novel, I started with what I thought was an amazing motive for murder. And as soon as I thought of that motive, I was like, I have to write a book in which that is the motive for murder. So with that one, I started with the end and, and worked back to the beginning. But normally I start with the beginning. So then once I know I really like my initial idea, then other ideas start just appearing and adding themselves to the original idea. And when there's too much for me to cart around in my brain, that's when I start working on a plan. I then do a very, very thorough plan. Then I do lots of editorial work on the plan. Now, not editorial work in terms of making the sentences beautiful. In fact, my plans are very often a complete mess and almost unreadable to anyone else. But for me, the editorial work that I do after my first draft of the plan is kind of structural editorial work. So that's my opportunity. Before I've written any mistakes into an actual book, that's my opportunity to make sure that all the elements of the story and the plot and what happens when all of everything is in the right position. Then once I'm sure I've got all that structural stuff and plot stuff sorted, then I start writing the actual book. And at that point, I'm no longer making plot decisions. I'm just looking at what's in my plan for each chapter and then writing it and making it come to life as well and as vividly as possible. Interesting. Uh, if, if you ever had a chance, Sophie, to uh, meet Agatha Christie, what would you want to say to her? 
apart from the thank you? <laughs> I would probably be too scared to meet her. Like, I, I think people say never meet your heroes. And whenever I really hero worship someone, I'm actually quite glad that I can't meet them. I think it's really, it's interesting actually, because I've got a very close friend who, who doesn't really have heroes in the way that I do. She always says, you know, if you turn someone into a hero in your mind, then you're putting them on a pedestal and it's not realistic. And, and I, I agree with her actually, but I just can't help hero worshiping several people. And when I do hero worship people, I always would rather they stayed slightly out of sight and out of reach like God or the wizard of Oz. Um, so I'm very happy with just worshiping Agatha from afar if I did meet her, I would probably be so tongue-tied that I'm not sure I'd be able to ask anything. What I would secretly want to know is, which of my Poirot novels does she like best and why? In fact, I would probably like her to put them in an order of favourite to least favourite and tell me why. That would be fascinating. Um, but then obviously I would never ask that question because she might say, well, I don't like any of them, Sophie. Quite frankly, I don't like any of them. And then I would be devastated. So this is one of the reasons why one should never meet one's heroes. I'm sure she would never say that. But I, I was wondering if you would want to know um, where she disappeared in those 11 days of her life. No, I wouldn't. You know, it's so funny. So many people are so interested in that whole story. And I'm just not. Like, partly because we know where she was. She turned up at the hotel in Harrogate you know, the Swan Hotel, which is now where the um, Harrogate Crime Festival takes place. But to me, she was probably in either that hotel for the whole period or other hotels. I don't think it's mysterious. Her marriage was in trouble at that point. Her husband, Archie Christie, had just told her that he wanted a divorce. And I think he'd also just told her that he was having an affair with a, a mutual friend. And I think she just thought, I am very miserable with this situation. You know, I'm not happy about the situation. I'm very miserable. And she just wanted to get away from it all. And so she did. Uh, one of the big mysteries for me is why anyone thinks that mis that's mysterious. You know, I I'm sure loads of people, if they, were, if they were in a really unhappy personal situation and a, a new blow happened and their husband said they were divorcing them, anyone might want to run away and go and stay in a hotel somewhere far away. So, so I'm not convinced there's any more to it than that, really. I think it's pretty normal that she left her husband and walked away for 11 days because he was struggling a little bit. So, uh, yeah, but, but that, that, that's something that's very intriguing. 11 days of Agatha Christie's life, maybe the, that's a subject for a mystery novel in itself, maybe. Well, books have been written about that and films have been made. I think there's probably three or four books and films that are kind of um, putting forward fictional versions of what she did during the 11 days. But I, my guess is she was in a hotel or a series of hotels feeling generally miserable and annoyed with her husband. <laughs> How do you think uh, Poirot would have dealt with uh, the 21st century? Well, I think, he, I think we've got a clue in some of Agatha's later books about him because in books like Third Girl mm -hmm. and um, Hickory Dickory Dock, we see him over and over again reacting to modern behaviours, modern fashions, hairstyles, clothes. He's always kind of noticing what the youth of today are doing, saying, wearing. So I think he would have been interested and a keen observer of... Uh, all the new developments. But I, I, the impression I get from reading Agatha's prior novels is that he, at a certain point, he starts to feel as though he's no longer in his time and he's entering a more modern time in which he's an old man who doesn't quite, he's not quite current anymore. He's like an old person in a new time. Certainly in Third Girl, that sense is very, is very present. So, um, yeah, I guess in the 21st century, he'd be even more like that, thinking this is now a very different time from my ideal time. Or maybe Poirot's grandson comes back in some form. Um, yeah, like I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't make that happen. As far as I'm aware, Poirot doesn't have any grandchildren. So. 
<laughs> I think it's fine for him not to have any grandchildren. And that's why, you know, when we, when um, Harper Collins and the Christie family and I were all deciding when we wanted my prior novels to be set, we all decided that um, between 1928 and 1932, that was a very good spot for them to slot into because Agatha didn't write any Poirot novels during that period. So, you know, Poirot's unaccounted for during those years. So that's when my novels about him are set. And I'm really pleased about that because that is when he's in his heyday, I think. That's when he's at his most Poirot-ish in the 20s and 30s, maybe early 40s as well. So moving on from Poirot to your own novels, where do you get the time to write your own books? You know, you well, are... ta- when it comes to time, we all have exactly the same amount of it. We all have 24 hours in a day and we all get to choose how we want to spend those hours. Um, the novelist Danielle Steele, have you heard of Danielle Steele? Yep. She writes 22 novels a year. Wow. So she obviously doesn't do as much of other things as I do. Um, Yeah, I have found that since I started writing, one of the things that I've got better and better at is using my time efficiently. So it used to take me three years. My first published crime novel took me three years to write and edit and get right. Now, because I've developed all these systems and processes and I can do everything more efficiently and I've got a much more, um, a much more developed, and sophisticated editorial sensibility so I'll have an idea recognize that it's rubbish decide not to do it and that can take 10 seconds 15 years ago I would have written the rubbish idea then tried to rewrite it then finally given up on it so I'm just getting more efficient about doing doing equally good work in a shorter time now the problem with that is as I've got more efficient, I've started to believe that I can do anything, that there's no such thing as not enough time. And so when someone says, do you want to do this fun, exciting project? I'm like, yes, I do. And I can. And then I do find that sometimes I have to, even even being efficient, I have to work more hours than is good for me. So I need to sort of watch that tendency and not take on too much. You also write a lot of poetry and then you uh, write self-help books, uh, you write your own crime fiction. Uh, how easy or difficult is it to kind of keep shuffling between what you are writing and, and uh, uh, Agatha Christie novels and, and uh, tend to not get confused with the writing styles with and maintain completely distinct? Uh, yeah, I find it really easy because I have a break in between projects. I would find it difficult if I had to one day write Poirot and the next day write a self-help book and the next day write, you know, a contemporary thriller. But I'm, I'm a serial writer. So I, I decide what book I'm writing. I then write only that book until it's finished. And it's a very all-consuming and immersive process. Then I have a really long break before starting writing the next book. So what I'm finding, actually, as I have more experience, is that I write, I take less time to do the actual writing and more time having a break and kind of replenishing my creative energy in between books. I'm certainly not, there's a a writer friend of mine, she'll write the end on one book on one day and the very next day she starts her next book. I don't know how she does that. that, that just blows my mind it takes me a lot of time to come come out of the book that i'm writing before i actually start something else so yeah and your and your imagination and your brain needs a bit of a rest and a bit of downtime so uh sophie uh, uh the other interesting part of yours is your career uh your non-writing career and as an academician so uh, tell us more about this uh, master's course that you have at cambridge that you created and you now run uh, and uh, yeah, it sounds well, I, interesting in terms of masters in crime and uh, through the writing. So, uh, yeah, exactly. So it's a it's a master's degree program in crime and thriller writing. I co-created it uh, with Midge Gillis, who is the the head of creative writing at uh, at Cambridge University. Um, and she just said to me, "How do you fancy doing a crime and thriller writing masters?" I was like, "Oh, that sounds exciting." 
Um, I was also very tempted. I'm tempted. I was tempted by the fact that it's Cambridge University, which I love. I live in Cambridge. I was already a fellow and I am a fellow of Lucy Cavendish College. Um, so yeah, I, I really like the idea of it. And I knew that all the teaching would happen in this beautiful building called Maddingley Hall, which is like something out of an Agatha Christie novel. It's this beautiful old hall with like mullioned stone windows and beautiful views of lawns with like knot gardens and like topiary. It's just stunning. So I thought, oh, fancy teaching there. Um, so yeah, so it's a brilliant course. It's a two year course. It's low residency. And so people travel from all over the world. We have many international students and you only need to actually be on site in Cambridge for about 12 days in the whole two years. So in the first year, we have four residential teaching modules. So everyone comes to Maddingley Hall and stays for three nights and does four days of classes. And that happens four times throughout the first year. Then the second year is when people go away and work on their big project, which is a crime or thriller novel. And then at the very end, they submit their novel. That's kind of like their dissertation. And they are marked on a combination. I mean, actually, the main component of their mark is for the, the longer piece, the crime novel. But also some of the creative work they do in the first year, of the taught part of the course, also goes towards their overall mark. And we have maximum numbers of 18 in each group. So there's we will never let in, well, I can't say we never will, but at the moment, the rule is, maximum of 18 students per cohort um, and it's amazing now unfortunately just as we were getting going with our first ever cohort we had the first residential module and it was amazing it was just such a great experience but then halfway through the second one covid happened and somebody had a cough and everyone had to go home and uh, many of us weren't even there in the first place, including me, because we'd had symptoms. And so the second one was kind of ruined by COVID. So we've actually done this thing called intermitting, which is where you basically stop a course and then you restart it later. So we're restarting it next February. Um, and, and so our current cohort can still do their remaining residential modules then. Uh, we are also very soon going to be opening applications for the next cohort. So the next cohort will start in September 2021. The first residential module starts on September the 22nd next year. Uh, and applications will be opening very soon. Uh, so if anyone is interested in applying, please do, because it's an amazing course. And you can find out more details by, if you Google... Um, Institute of Continuing Education, Crime and Thriller, Masters, the result, the page will come up and you'll find it. That's wonderful, um, uh, Sophie. Tell us more about the dream author. I think that's something which uh, is relevant to everybody who wants to write and who probably has yeah. a few books. So uh, tell us about it. You know, I read about it and I was really, really, uh, you know, in awe of it. So... So dream author, dream author is not anything to do with a university. It's not an academic thing at all. Dream author is a coaching program for writers. I realized at a certain point that most of the problems and obstacles that writers face are not external facts in the world. They are things that the writer is thinking but mistaking for external facts in the world. For example, a writer who has published three books and they haven't sold very well might very easily start to think, I'm not a successful writer. Mm. You know, I, other people can be hugely successful. I obviously can't. And that's not true. They are imagining that their past sales figures mean something about their ability to achieve success in future but what if they just decided that their past sales figures don't mean anything about their ability to create success like before i had my first really successful book my first really successful book was my first crime novel and before that before i started writing crime i wrote three novels that were not crime none of them sold very well at all and obviously that was disappointing, 
But I never even considered looking at those poor sales figures and thinking, this means I'm an unsuccessful writer. What I thought was, those results were disappointing, but I am still totally going to be a massively successful writer. And I don't know when that's going to happen, but at some point I am definitely going to sell a shed load of books. And because I thought that, and I didn't make those sales figures mean that I would always have bad sales figures, I felt energized and ambitious rather than discouraged and miserable. And so because all of our actions are driven by our feelings and our feelings are created by our thoughts, really, if we want to achieve the the biggest success we can and be as happy as we can as writers, we need to realize that most of our blocks and obstacles are the thoughts we are thinking, not any external facts. And I just, I got really excited about the idea of uh, starting a coaching program. And so that is what I did. And it's, it's now into its second year and it's just taken off. It's just incredible. Um, And the writers are literally transforming their writing fortunes. I had one member who thought that no one would want her book because her sales in the past had been so bad and she was 74 And I coached her extensively for a long time within the Dream Author Programme. She ended up getting an offer from a big five publisher for 400 grand for two books. So, and that's just one example. Dozens and dozens of dream authors, as I call them, are achieving huge success using this coaching method. Um, So, yeah, so that's very exciting. Now, if any of you would like information about Dream Author, because there is a special offer on at the moment. And and people are are joining from everywhere in the world. We've got members in Australia, America, China, everywhere. Um, So if you're interested in Dream Author, and especially in the special offer that's currently on, all you need to do is email me, sophie at sophiehanna.com, and put Dream Author in the subject line, and I will send you the special offer. So that's sophie at sophiehanna.com with dream author in the subject line. And I'll send you all the goodies. I'm sure all the people on this call are going to take you up on that. uh, (laughs) It's an incredible concept. So so best of luck for that. Uh, So my last question before we move on to questions from the audience is, uh, uh, ever thought about bringing um, uh, Poirot on a trip to India? Um. Well, I've, I, I mean, I, I, I sort of have and haven't thought about it. So it's crossed my mind because early on I was interviewed by an Indian journalist who suggested it to me. And I thought to myself, yeah, actually, I could see that working. But then there are also lots of other locations that I can think. Yeah. And it's just a question of choosing, you know, which story do I want to tell? Where do I want to set it? But it's certainly something that I would not necessarily rule out. Okay. So uh, maybe a few years down the line, we'll see a Hakir Boyo set in, in New Delhi or Bombay or one of those cities. I'd need, I'd need to come and do a lot of research first, but it, it's, it is possible. I can't guarantee it, but uh, you know, I don't want to rule it out. Sure. So uh, we move on to some audience questions. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a few questions that, that we've got. Uh, maybe we'll start with uh, Rohan Joshi. Uh, Rohan, if you could uh, unmute yourself and ask your questions, please. Mm-hmm. Rohan, go ahead. Hi. Uh, there was one question on uh, Ariadne Olivier. Uh, why and how do you think she came about and uh, who is she really based on? That's question number one. And the second one is in the later Poirot uh, uh, you know, novels, He's shown to be a devout Catholic, which there was no indication of his, uh, you know, religiosity or whatever you may want to call it prior to that. So uh, when and how do you think this transformation happened uh, on Poirot? Um, I don't know about the Catholic thing. Not sure about that. Um... It's on uh, Murder in the Orient Express. If you... uh, sort of uh, see the initial uh, scenes either yeah. in uh, you know the YouTube or uh, you know in the book yeah uh, Poirot is shown to be kind of you know 
uh, praying to... Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, but that's not a later Poirot. I mean, Murder on the Orange Express is quite an early one. So I think, you know, probably it, it was part of his character in all the books that he was a devout Catholic. And it's just that in some of the books it came out more than it did in others. But my assumption has always been that he's, he's always been a devout Catholic. Um, to answer your other question, it seems fairly clear to me that Ariadne Oliver is a character that Agatha created in order to be able to kind of gently poke fun at some aspects of what being a writer is like. So there's a really brilliant bit in one of the books she features in, I can't remember which one, where she's complaining because she has to go and give a talk about her life as a writer. She's sort of saying irritably, she's saying, I don't know why everyone wants to hear about how writers write. It must be obvious, you know, you have an idea and then you write it down and that's it. And why is everyone so interested in hearing writers talk? Uh, so I think that is Agatha's way of sort of commenting on writers on, and the writing life. Uh, thank you. Um, next up, uh, thanks, thanks for question Chris. from Nidhi Sriharsha. Uh, Nidhi, if you could unmute yourself and ask a question. Thank you for that. And thank you, Sophie, for such an interactive session. I think uh, I have been in love uh, with Agatha Christie since a long time. And I really love the world of crime. I find it very interesting and daunting. So I think my question is, since you're constantly dealing with the plot of crime, um, do you find yourself do you find it difficult being surrounded by all the intense research and you know it's the area of criminology so do you find it difficult dealing with such thoughts sometimes um i don't really and i think that's possibly because i mean in terms of research i i just do almost as little as i need to for each book i don't spend huge amounts of time reading about murder and miserable depressing things like that so that's, that obviously makes it better. But also, um, yeah, I, I, the kind of crime that I write about where there's a mystery and a solution and it's all very kind of ingenious and clever and clues and all of that is so different from real crime, you know. Uh, I mean, obviously, crime fiction has its conventions. The reader wants a mystery to solve. Based on my experience of real crime, because I have done quite a lot of work in prisons in the past where I've gone in as a visiting writer to prisons, real crime doesn't often have an interesting motive or a big mystery. It's just like someone, you know, had anger problems or was drunk and just like killed someone and didn't even really know why. And so for me, fictional crime is a very different thing from real crime. Uh, and that's why you know, what I love about crime fiction is the mystery. It's not, I'm not particularly interested in crime or murder. I'm interested in mysteries and puzzles and solving them and human psychology much more than the actual crime. Thank you. Um, up next, we've got a question from Akshara Mahesh. Akshara, you will have to unmute yourself, please. Hi, I just wanted to know, how did you retain the character of Poirot and all his characteristics while still adding your own touch? Was that quite challenging? So I wrote about Poirot as if he was a real person in real life that I know. I just wrote about him as if I was writing about someone I know from my own life, which in a way he is, right? Because I've read all the books about him and I've watched all the TV adaptations. And I didn't really try to make him different or change him in any way. I just saw my job as being to write about Agatha Christie's Poirot as she created him. Thank you. Thanks. Right. Um, Sachdev Ramakrishna, your question next, please. Um, thank you. Um, Sophie, it's been it's splendid to hear you, and I think it's been a fantastic session. I just was curious about your book on happiness. Oh, and yeah. 66 ways to solve it. Why 66? And of course, happiness. That is so, ah. so relevant in these times. So thank you. Yeah. Um, so the book is actually called Happiness, a Mystery, oh, yeah, and 66 it. attempts to solve it. And the reason it's called that is that in the book, I approach happiness as if it's a mystery that I'm setting out to solve. What is happiness? Where do we find it? How do we find it? How do we achieve it? 
And I think in the introduction to the book, I actually say, I'm going to be like the Poirot in this investigation and I'm going to go and pursue the trail of clues and I'm going to look at the case files so far and I'm going to solve the mystery of happiness. And one of the other things I say in the introduction is, why 66? If you're asking the question, why 66? Then that means that you are the ideal sidekick to solve the mystery with me. Right. Uh, and I can't say any more than that because it would be a spoiler. <laughs> Splendid. I'm going to run to a bookshop and grab a copy. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks. Up next, uh, we have a question from Lata Reddy. Lata, if you could unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes we can. Yeah, well, my question was just, uh, how do you change your creative style when you write your poetry, your own novels, and the Poirot novels? Well, the styles are obviously very different for all three, but it's not, I'm never aware of changing my style. What happens is, if I know that I'm going to be writing, for example, Poirot, then when I go into my writing room and sit down and get ready to start writing, my imagination, without me even having to instruct it particularly, it just makes that shift into Poirot mode. So that when I start typing, I'm already in Poirot mode in my brain. And the same happens with my contemporary thrillers, with poetry, with my self-help books, with my podcast. Oh, the, I should tell you this as well. If any of you do not know, I have a podcast which is completely free to listen to. And it's called How to Hold a Grudge. And it's a self-help podcast all about how we can process anger and grudges and deal with the annoyingness of some of the people in our lives in a way that actually makes us happier and more forgiving. Um, so, so, so sometimes I'm podcasting about grudges and anger and other times I'm writing mysteries and I just, in, in the spaces between the different activities, my subconscious and my imagination just do whatever work they need to so that I arrive at each one in that mode to do that one? Well, uh, the reason I asked is because I read your book, The Narrow Bed, and I yeah. found that absolutely fascinating. And I've also read two of your Poirot novels. I'm looking forward to reading the new one. And, uh, uh, you know, I could see a complete shift in, the, uh, in your uh, style. And I thought yeah. that must be so difficult, but the way you explain yeah. it, it comes very easily to you. Yeah, and what's so weird is when, you, when I think of my Poirot novels and then The Narrow Bed, they could absolutely have been written by two different people. And I can see what you mean. It's yeah. so different, but, but no, it all comes out of the same weird brain. <laughs> so obviously my imagination is just like doing these subtle shifts and uh and that's really lucky because otherwise if i if i was trying to write a Poirot novel and my contemporary novel voice kept popping up that would be very inconvenient <laughs> oh, yes but uh we all wish we had your wonderful brain and uh, as i said i can't wait to read your new book thank you thank you right uh up next sachin mule if you could unmute yourself and ask your question please go ahead yeah, uh, so my question is more in terms of, uh, is there any chance of adapting uh, your Poirot to the screen, to the big screen? Uh, I think there's a, there's a chance because, um, you know, it could always happen, but um, there are certainly no plans at the moment. I think all the film and TV people are still very keen on doing new versions of Agatha's stories. And I think for as long as that remains the case, and this sort of Agatha screen revival remains ongoing, I don't think the, the family, the Christie family, would particularly want to muddy the waters and bring in new prior stories to the sort of screen operation. Uh, I could be wrong, but I suspect that if mine were ever to be adapted, it would only be quite some way into the future. And I have to say, I am very happy with them not being done for film and TV because... <sighs> I kind of feel as though I love TV, I love film, but I think it's very hard to adapt a book 
and get all of its kind of magic onto the screen. It can be done. I mean, I think David Suchet as Poirot on many occasions succeeded brilliantly. And it's like, wow, this really is as brilliant as the book. Or not, or not quite, but nearly. But more often, when books are adapted for the screen, then they don't anywhere, anywhere near live up to the book. So I'm very happy for my books to remain as books. Lovely. I think that's about uh, time we have. Uh, Ravi, any last questions that you had before we uh, let Sophie go? No, I've asked all of my questions, so I'm, I'm Excellent. fine. Well, uh, delightful delightful conversation. I just loved it, yeah. Yeah, likewise, uh, delightful conversation. Thank you so much, Ravi. Of course, thank you, You're Hannah. You're welcome. Thank and, you for uh, having me. Saturday evening, really well spent for most of us here in India. And I hope to be able to do this in person sometime soon. Yes, I would love to come back. I, You know, I have such fond memories of sitting by that swimming pool and like thousands of people <laughs> walking over. Do you remember? I was just there on my yeah. little lounge next to the pool and everyone was like what's that woman doing in a swimming costume <laughs> right in the middle of these crowds but i'm a i'm an obsessive swimmer so uh, yeah i would love to come back yeah, we really hope so too and, and we'll be sure to have you back again uh, when we can excellent lovely hope, lovely uh, hope your book you. does really well sophie thanks so thank much you. for uh, being with us again and ravi thank you once again uh, and Sophie, it was wonderful chatting to you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Lovely to talk to you. Bye.